Welcome back to the second panel um, for this uh, really wonderfully exciting conference on sexualities and queer imaginaries in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I'm Debbie Weinstein. I'm the director of the Gender and Sexuality Studies program here at Brown and the associate director of the Pembroke Center. Um, and I'm very proud that uh, we are one of the co-sponsors of uh, this important event. Um, and I just want to thank um, Syed and the other conference organizers for all their effort and work to bring this together. Um, following the format of the first session, each speaker will um, speak for about 20 minutes, um, and then we'll have a collective question and answer session at the end. Um, I will not be giving long introductions for each person. I encourage you to look at the conference website for um, longer biographies of each speaker. Our first speaker today is Jason Ritchie, uh, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Florida International University. So, at the risk of biting the hand that's feeding me, actually it didn't feed me this morning, uh, but it is paying for my very nice room at the Biltmore and graciously flew me here from Miami to this dark and gloomy, wet place. Uh, I want to begin with an intentionally provocative and only partly ironic declaration, and I apologize for my voice, I'm recovering from something awful. So my provocative and partly ironic declarations. Queer Palestinians do not exist. So for dramatic effect, I can say it again. Queer Palestinians do not exist. I said that this declaration is partly ironic. After all, I'm fully aware that I, a white American queer man, have been invited under, I think, the assumption that I'll have something to say about queer Palestinians, which is, which would be a reasonable assumption given that I've built my academic career, which I hope even after today has a few good years left in it, largely on the production of knowledge about the experiences and lives of queer Palestinians. So I'm aware of my complicity in the processes and practices that I'm gonna criticize here today, but even as I make my own work vulnerable to critique and face, face the awful, unthinkable risk of being seen as inconsistent or, God willing, will, uh, able to admit that at some point long ago in my intellectual thinking I got something wrong, uh, I want anyway to try and, again, as I said, offer a provocative critique. and I'm, attracted to this possibility, the possibility of provoking, uh, because in my reading of it anyway, so much of what passes as queer and leftist or progressive critique today tends more to paralyze than to provoke, more to foreclose movement than instigate it. So when I say queer Palestinians do not exist, I do not, of course, mean that there are no Palestinians who engage in what some might call queer practices, nor do I mean that there are no Palestinians who, in fact, identify as queer or lesbian or gay or trans or whatever. I know many. I may even have been queer with a few. But I'm reminded here, as I expect some of you might be, a former Iranian president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, famous declaration a few years ago at Columbia University that there are no gays in Iran. And what interested me then was less the intent of Ahmadinejad's statement than the ferocious response of the audience and the ensuing response of North American and European queers and liberals generally to Ahmadinejad's insistence that there are no gays in Iran. The response, I think, had very little to do with Iran or its gays or even Ahmadinejad. We, and I'll be using this we very tentatively and incompletely, but intentionally, were so offended because in just a few words, Ahmadinejad insulted the integrity. He assaulted the integrity. He questioned the truth of a story we've been telling ourselves for a long time about Iran and one of its primary characters, the suffering Iranian queer. But what was really so profoundly awful and offensive to so many people about 
Ahmadinejad's denial of Iranian queers, I think, was that in so doing, he indirectly undermined the agency, the autonomy, the right to be seen of North American and European queers, whose existence always depends on a constitutive other, in this case, the Iranian queer. So what I mean when I say queer Palestinians do not exist is that in much the same way that Chandra Mohanty argued uh, a few decades ago that uh, in her seminal critique of Western feminist representations of third world women, uh, North American and European queers have similarly constructed queer Palestinians as a category of analysis. A romanticized constellation of narratives and images that make all kinds of claims about the world and in particular about the space of Israel-Palestine and that make claims about certain bodies and lives, that is to say queer Palestinian bodies and lives, but that in fact have very little to do with the reality of those spaces and bodies and lives and much more to do, I think, with North American and European spaces and bodies and lives. And so throughout Europe and North America, the queer Palestinian, in capital letters, here has floated to the top of a cauldron full of suffering queer others as one of the most powerful representations of everything we are not. And in this sense, it seems to me the real work, or at least some of the most troubling and, and surprising work that's accomplished in this constant conjuring up of queer Palestinians is that it allows some queers to demonstrate their radical credentials and the sincerity of their commitments to fighting racism, capitalism, colonialism, and all kinds of other social and economic and political processes in which they are in fact deeply embedded, unlike those bad homonormative queers whose assimilationist politics focuses solely on the right to get married and have babies. The queer Palestinian, in other words, exists here only as a, or chiefly as a discursive device through which a properly queer North American European subjectivity is constructed. So I'm fully aware that this is not a revolutionary or even new argument. Jasper Poir has made a very similar argument when she introduced the theory of homonationalism, which she, use, which she uses to describe the incorporation of some queers by the neoliberal nation state in a specific time and place, which is to say post 9-11 in North America and Europe, and what she referred to as the parallel and interconnected targeting of queerly raced bodies for dying. Uh, I want to make clear, I think, that Poir's work was an important intervention. It inspired me in my own work, and more broadly, it's opened up all kinds of avenues for thinking differently about queerness and racism and nationalism and state violence. Uh, and also, it's one of the few academic interventions that has accrued some value in non-academic context, homonationalism, and critiques of homonationalist representations, or pinkwashing, are now widely used among properly radical, that is to say, again, non-assimilationist or homonormative queers, in all kinds of places. And I've written uh, recently in more detail about these processes, and particularly the ways in which homonationalism has come to be used by some North American and European queers. And I don't want to rehearse that same argument here. What I do want to say, though, is that it seems to me that uh, homonationalism homo as, a, as a concept, as a, as a theory, is a useful heuristic device for thinking about how and why images of queers and proclamations of tolerance and their inverse have become very useful in some places. That is to say, they demonstrate the civilizational superiority of the Western self and the depravity and backwardness of the non-Western homophobic other. Uh, at the same time, though, Jasper Poir and her devotees have taken this theory, which effectively describes particular processes in a particular time and place, and transformed it into a theory for everything queer. In the process, I think they've constructed a stale and not very accurate or productive narrative of queerness that depends on a static and unit unitary category of persons, queers of color, 
And in that story that homo nationalism and its critics tell us, the queer Palestinian is more synecdoche than subject. Homo nationalism, in, in other words, has become something like patriarchy, and in the same way that some, especially early theorizations of patriarchy, relied both on the construction of homogeneous categories of people, women, and a total lack of attention to the concrete material processes that actually determine the experiences of particular women in particular places, homonationalism promises an answer so complete and universal that it does not require the queer critic or activist to actually pay attention to the mundane details of other places, other bodies, and other lives. And so, lest I be mistaken here for advocating silence or inaction, a kind of nihilistic antisocial retreat from or rejection of the political, there are plenty of other white gay men, Leo Bersani, Lita Edelman, who are very happy to make those kinds of arguments. I want to conclude by saying that, on the contrary, what I'm calling for is a kind of politics and theory of the ordinary. What I'm trying to do in this case is again provoke a move away from a sole emphasis on big structures and formulaic types of people and places and things and ask how we might think about and engage differently with the world and with other people by paying attention to the ordinariness of everyday life. And so I'm clearly inspired here by uh, Kathleen Stewart's beautiful book, Ordinary Affects, in which she notes the, significant, the significance of ordinary, and I'm um, quoting briefly, capacities to affect and be affected. Uh, and the significance, she says, lies in the intensities they build and what thoughts and feelings they make possible. The question they beg, Stewart writes, is not what they might mean in an order of representations, or whether they're good or bad in an overarching scheme of things, but where they might go, and what potential modes of knowing, relating, and attending to things are already somehow present in them in a state of potentiality and resonance. So in that spirit, I want to recount two ordinary moments from my fieldwork in Israel-Palestine. These moments have never left me, and uh, it's not as if in the mental fog induced by my cocktail of cold medicine and coffee last night, uh, these moments resurface from some deep place in my psyche, uh, but because they seem so terribly ordinary, and because I could not, when I was still drinking the Kool-Aid of homo nationalism, fit them within the grand scheme of things in any meaningful or symbolic way, I've never really shared these two scenes with an academic audience or, or even thought very seriously about them. So scene one, early in my field work of Kaos, a queer Palestinian organization with which many of you are probably familiar, uh, was hosting weekly discussion groups that were open to members of the community and that were at the time becoming quite popular. They were these weekly get-togethers were conceived of and facilitated as moderately structured spaces in which people could share their experiences, listen to each other, and learn from each other. Hanin Maiki, with whom many of you are also familiar and who I'm proud to say I knew before she became famous and started hanging out with important people like Judith Butler and Sarah Schulman, invited me to come to the group, and I'd like to say that I felt something like the satisfaction Clifford Geertz describes when he, is, when he and his wife are arrested and they suddenly develop rapport with their Balinese informants, but I was completely terrified. I had become something of a fixture at Alcalde's offices and at more public events, and I'd like to think I engaged in a respectful and humane way with those spaces and people I encountered in them. But this was an intimate, almost private space. People would be sharing ordinary details of their lives with each other. I wanted desperately not to be, and I think now I could never really shake the fear that in so many ways I was, like Clifford Geertz, an anthropologist after all, 
And there was something about such ordinariness that I worried I should in order not to be like Beards of Void. But I showed up sick with fear and anxiety and a few minutes into a cigarette on the balcony with Sammy, whom I had recently met, a bird chat on my head. I stood there, cigarette dangling from my lips, bird shit dripping down my face, in some emotional place beyond fear and anxiety, I was paralyzed. My overwhelming urge to cry or jump off the balcony only dissipated slightly when Sammy left and quickly returned with towels and in the sweetest and most loving way, cleaned the bird shit off my face, laughed and assured me that I should not worry as it was a sign of good luck. Scene two. Seven or eight months later, Sammy and I had become intimate in ways that anthropologists are not supposed to talk about. As things slowly began to sour, we both struggled to figure out how to relate to each other in different ways, a task that was only complicated by the fact that we were enmeshed in a tight circle of friends who, alongside their deep and undeniable care and concern for both of us, seemed always a little too prepared to witness our drama. This is what anthropologists call an emic term. In a, a drama, in a series of events that I recall even now with horror, Sammy came to Tel Aviv where I was living at the time to spend the night with me and we had dinner with a group of friends and then went to a local bar. At the bar, after fortuiti fortuitously witnessing Sammy kiss and make out with another guy, I, as I have once or twice been known to do, created a scene. I believe I may also recall being picked up by one of our friends, like a baby, in both his arms, kicking and screaming obscenities at Sammy as he carried me out the door. A few hours later, Sammy began calling and texting. He was alone in Tel Aviv with no place to sleep. After waiting long enough to respond that I was sure Sammy knew I was waiting long enough to respond, I curtly told him I was home and he was welcome to sleep on the floor. When he arrived, we sat on the stoop of my building, shoulder to shoulder, smoking cigarettes and watching the sun come up. We were exhausted, and the moment seemed so precarious, I think, that we both sat in silence for fear of upsetting this calm. And then I heard an odd, vaguely familiar sound, looked to my left at Sammy, and watched the bird chip drip down his face. We cleaned him up and held each other and laughed until we fell asleep. So more in the interest, uh, I'm told I have less than two minutes left, more in the interest of time than anything, I want to end rather abruptly with these two very ordinary moments. And in presenting themselves, in pre presenting them as if they speak for themselves, I do not mean to suggest that they do, in fact, speak for themselves, nor that I've sworn off the tasks of analysis, critique, and contextualization, whatever my discomfort with it, the fact remains that I'm an anthropologist, not a comedian or a reporter. And in focusing on the mundane, the ordinary, two moments of, two encounters of laughter, love, shame, and shit, I'm not suggesting that life, especially in Israel-Palestine, is not serious and structured in so many ways by extreme violence and pain. But it seems to me that even as we criticize the violence of the Israeli state and the horrors of the occupation, it is also crucially important and perhaps in a way quite radical to talk about the very ordinary, very human experiences of queer Palestinians whose existence is permitted, who can be seen by homo nationalists and their presumably radical critics only as victims. And in the space of suffering and death to which queer Palestinians are so often consigned, the everyday, the ordinariness of life is unthinkable.
speaker is Sarah Schulman, novelist and distinguished professor of English at the City University of New York, College of Staten Island. Hello, everybody. Saed, thank you so much for the invitation. And Radir, thank you for coming all the way from Palestine to be here. My talk is called To Be in Solidarity with Palestine. Solidarity with Palestine is an aspiration that for me is constantly being interrogated, rearranged, deepened, upended. It's a path filled with error, hubris, longing, and above all, the obligation to strive towards the goal of being self-critical, big picture, and effective. There is no clear definition out there waiting to be applied. Many people use the word solidarity, but few agree on its meaning, which remains elusive until we do the work to face, internalize, and take it on. Exactly how to carry that out and what to do, in addition to boycott, divestment, and sanctions, is something to be discovered on a daily basis, since we cannot know which gesture, moment, turn, or event will produce the desired objective and end to the occupation. Each investigation into the meaning of solidarity opens up a new range of questions. One Palestinian leader living in exile told me, solidarity means decolonizing your mind. An Israeli dissident and draft resistor described it as a gray zone. Another Palestinian leader who lives in Palestine said, solidarity for me has the same high standard as friendship. But then I ask, what is friendship? So over the years, I've come to understand four basic responsibilities at the root of solidarity with Palestine. First, the responsibility to intervene. When we see another person being brutalized, scapegoated, blamed for things they have not caused, falsely accused, punished unjustly, shunned, subjected to oppressive state intervention, displaced, incarcerated, and murdered, and that person and their community are asking us to help, I believe that we each have a responsibility to intervene. Even if we don't know the person, even if we don't like the person, justice is by definition not a popularity contest. We especially have a responsibility to intervene if we are implicated, if our clique, family, community, our nation, religion, or race are the aggressors, if we know the names of the people who are driving the aggression, are providing false justification for the cruelty, or are trying to impose a code of silence about the cruelty. If we have their email addresses, then we have a special responsibility to intervene. The problem arises exactly at this moment, when those taking unjust action are the people we know, live with, are related to, or are people we are dependent on for approval or access or recognition when the people acting unjustly are our friends. So solidarity with someone who is being brutalized by people we know, identify with, or fear, by definition implies a loss. But the fact remains that the loss of the approval of family members or of arts funding or of having parties to go to will never equal the loss of the 2,200 people who were murdered by aerial bombing in Gaza in the summer of 2014. The bother of having to practice the politics of repetition required to raise consciousness about Palestine, the annoyance of being yelled at or slandered by supporters of the Israeli state, even the fear of threats and accusations, censorship or loss of employment will never equal living in a refugee camp, being denied a passport, having your water stolen, and being subjected to violence by Israeli police and soldiers. Real friendship is dialogic, not obedient. Real friendship means asking questions, looking at the order of events, challenging assumptions. We are morally obligated to question our governments, our families, our communities and friends who are participating passively or actively in the shunning or degradation of others, including the subjugation of Palestine. Unfortunately, people who justify bullying, group aggression and shunning or silencing equate silent submission with friendship. Being in solidarity with Palestine means upholding an ethic of interactive, communicative engagement as a definition of friendship. And that can be a dramatic change in the way one lives. Two, the responsibility to listen and also to hear. 
Palestinians are shunned. That means that they are not allowed into the conversation about their experience, reality, condition, and future. As an American, I have to work hard to hear Palestine. I have to look for alternative media like the Electronic Intifada or Mondo Weiss. I have to use social media intelligently, follow Twitter from Gaza, for example. I have to attend public talks and read books that are not reviewed in the New York Times. I have to both listen and hear, which are two distinctly different actions. From the very late date, shamefully 2009, when I began to put my attention fully toward hearing Palestine, the intake of information has forced a constant reevaluation of myself, my past, the history of my religion, and my family. It has also forced me to pay attention to my new opponents, supporters of the current Israeli state, and to deal with their committed refusal to rethink. I see a deep connection between authoritarian bullying and refusing to hear other people's experiences. The pathology of this insistence on stasis makes us understand in our own lives how truly corrupt it is to refuse to examine group bullying, especially when it's falsely represented as loyalty. But I'm also challenged in my scorn for this supremacy ideology to listen to individual Palestinian people whom I now know and work with, for, and beside. For example, when I first began my involvement, I conceptualized solidarity as support. So I primarily put my efforts into the already ongoing attempt to create platforms for Palestinians to be heard in the United States. After making the decision to join BDS, my first action was to organize a US tour for leaders of the Palestinian queer movement. After that, I co-organized the first LGBT delegation to Palestine. After that, I kept asking the people I was working with, what do you want me to do next? What do you want us to do? Finally, Hanin Mikey just said to me, it's not my responsibility to think up your strategy. As I recorded in my book, Israel, Palestine, and the Queer International in Ramallah, I met with Omar Barghouti, one of the best known Palestinian leaders of the boycott divestment sanctions movement. And at one point I asked him, what can I do? And he answered wisely, you will think of something. You will think of something. As PACB, the Palestine Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, says in their call for internationals, quote, during years of intensive work with partners in several countries to promote the cultural boycott of Israel, which is supported by an overwhelming majority of Palestinian artists, writers, filmmakers, and cultural institutions, PACB has thoroughly scrutinized many cultural product, projects and events assessing the applicability of the boycott criteria to them, and accordingly has issued open letters, statements, or advisory opinions on them. The three most important conclusions reached in this respect were, one, many of these events and projects fall into an uncertain gray area that is challenging to appraise. Two, it is important to emphasize that the boycott must target not only the complicit institutions, but also the inherent and organic links between them, which reproduce the machinery of colonial subjugation and apartheid. And three, strategically, not every boycottable project must be met with an active boycott campaign, as activists need to invest their energies in the highest priority campaigns in any given time. So it can be a bumpy road, but the request by PACB that international supporters of BDS practice, as PACB often puts it, common sense, is enlightening, nuanced, and a bold investment in the responsibility of individuals to be informed to reckon with what Palestinians are expressing and requesting, and to make intelligent, compassionate, and most importantly, informed decisions about how to best support their desire for autonomy and recognition. Solidarity with Palestine, therefore, does not mean doing what you are told, but rather it requires individuals to be conceptual, conscientious, and interpretive, which can only be achieved if there is some deep listening involved. Support, friendship, love, and loyalty are not rooted in obedience. We don't do things just because someone we identify with tells us to, unless our only goal is to punish and feel superior. If we really want fairer, richer, and more satisfying lives for the human community, we are required to be interactive, imaginative, compassionate, and most importantly, committed to problem solving. Now sometimes this backfires, and I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. I worked with the Armenian-American pro-Palestinian writer Nancy Kokorian, 
to create a Palestinian writers panel at the Pen American Annual Conference. It took five years to get Penn to do this. For five years, Penn had resisted this idea and imposed unacceptable obstacles, like having Israelis or American Jews on the panel. Penn also required that every country participating contribute a large amount of money, and since Palestine is not a country with a functional cultural budget, we had to raise these funds independently, and we did this in cooperation with Arte East and private donors. So finally, we were successful, and Penn invited three Palestinian writers, Rhonda Gerard, Ademia Shibli, and Najwan Darwish. This was to be the first time that a Palestinian-only panel of writers would be featured as an organic part of a high-profile mainstream publishing event in New York City. So we were ecstatic. Then we heard from PACB. They found the Penn Conference to be boycottable because, like many of the countries participating in the event, Israel had also paid the fee required for their writers to sit on other panels, and therefore Penn listed Israel as a sponsor. Now, I was upset because I felt that PACB did not comprehend the significance of the event. Yet, at the same time, these principles were more important than any specific event. And many people argue for the exceptionalism of their own actions. It's just arrogance. The Palestinian writers, of course, they could decide whatever they wanted to decide, but Nancy and I, who are in solidarity, we could not ignore PACB. So we were highly motivated to find a solution. Judith Butler then negotiated behind the scenes with Penn to organizationally reconceptualize the mandatory national donations to a separate category and away from the label sponsors, and then PACB changed their finding to no position, not endorsement and not, the, not opposition, the panel went on and was a meaningful, significant success, allowing literary New Yorkers to hear Palestinian intellectuals without mitigation or obstruction. It required communication, negotiation, and problem solving. In other words, it required an authentic relationship, neither obeying nor ignoring, but listening and communicating and negotiating with flexibility. Three, the responsibility to be effective. Have you ever been the object of injustice and asked for help? If so, perhaps you experienced someone else come along who, in terms of your experience, is privileged and protected. They say they will help, and then they make one gesture. They may send an email or have one difficult conversation, then when what they imagine as their own importance and supremacy fails to immediately transform an embedded situation, the person throws up their hands and drops the effort. It's too complicated, they say, or it will just take time, or it's not going to change. And other banalities get thrown in, at you as the dilettante moves on to another arena where, where they will instead be obeyed. I tried, they insist, and go back to their comfortable bubble where they can tell anyone who asks, I did do that one thing. Well, the point of solidarity is to be effective. It's not to cover your ass. But how can we be effective when the odds are so great? One answer is that we need to build campaigns, not just participate in singular actions or make isolated gestures. PACB provides clear guidance on this point. It's been very clear, for instance, that not every BDS campaign can win. Not every divestment vote brought forth will be successful. But each effort is a step in raising consciousness, building support, and informing the public. So the desire to truly help someone who is being treated badly requires us to commit to being in for the long haul and to organizing that haul so that there is at least a chance of success in the long term. Building campaigns is not simple, but it is easier when we are able to connect need to method to outcome. Each campaign begins with Palestinians, and that means we look at the range of things Palestinians are asking for and select one realm in which we think we can be effective. For example, let's say we choose to be effective in the Israeli product boycott. Though we may wish to immediately produce a campaign that will force every store in town to drop every Israeli product, if we only have four people, this is not going to work. So it, we have to set goals that are winnable, reasonable, and doable. The campaign to boycott the settlement product SodaStream provides an excellent model. They picked one item. They picketed stores. They went after Scarlett Johansson when she became SodaStream celebrity endorser, and they continued to have success in getting institutions and retail venues to drop the product. A similar campaign was organized around the obnoxiously named Sabra Hummus because of its parent company's enthusiastic financial support for the Israeli Defense Forces. Focusing on one product in specific venues has proven to be an effective strategy, especially on campuses 
cafeterias like that at Wesleyan, uh, for example, were persuaded to drop settlement products. I once had the experience of marching in a gay parade carrying a sign that said, end gay tourism to Israel. Now, pinkwashing is a subject close to my heart, and exploiting the hard-won gains of the Israeli LGBT movement to make claims of racial or religious supremacy as justifications for the occupation must be opposed. Carrying signs that call attention to an ongoing campaign made sense. But in that particular case, there was no campaign, just the signs. Since there was no specific goal, no organized strategy, and no action plan to propel that strategy, for me and others to carry that sign was not simply ineffective, it was hypocritical. I was acting as if I was part of a campaign, but actually there was nothing organized beyond the sign itself. I was wasting my commitment, posing, and being lazy. Asking for too much or having vague goals and not backing them up with actions is bad organizing. It does not fulfill the promise of being in solidarity. And finally, number four, the responsibility to be morally consistent. Ending the occupation requires a big picture. It's a huge change, one that cannot take place in isolation. Boycott divestment sanctions is, in a way, a model for living. It demands information, consciousness, conversation, discomfort, and confrontation in many arenas of daily life. We have to think about and face all of our institutions and relationships. What food is on our table? How do we get money? What do we do with it? What do we say and to whom? Does knowing someone for 25 years or being related to them mean we obey or are silent when they do harmful, unethical things? BDS says no. No, we don't. We have to deal with it. Every day I see people post expressions of solidarity with someone or some cause on Facebook or Twitter, and I'm too old for Tumblr. I don't even really know what it is. But they post or report statements in favor of peace, against injustice, and for negotiation and change. Yet many of these people are hypocrites. They won't endure the most minimal personal discomfort to actually realize the values they publicly claim to hold, especially if it's close to home. They won't have uncomfortable conversations. They won't stand up to people they know are causing pain because they don't want to lose access. They won't actively do what is necessary to overturn cruelty or exclusion for fear of becoming a target themselves or of facing their own lack of ability to create real change. They're falsely advertising themselves as favoring reconciliation and peace when they won't do what is required to achieve it. When someone publicly identifies specifically as being in solidarity with Palestine, even if it's a post on Facebook or carrying a sign, they're actually making a promise. This is a promise to listen, to hear, to act, to commit to multiple efforts, to negotiate, to be uncomfortable, to question themselves, because the claim to be pro-Palestinian implies asking a lot of other people. We're asking them to think differently, act differently, and live differently. So in order to truly be in solidarity, we also have to be willing to do the same. Thank you. Our third speaker um, is Gadir uh, Shafi, co-director of Aswad and a Palestinian gay woman. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me just start by affirming there are Palestinian queers. We do exist. If you have any doubts and happen to be a woman, I'm staying at the Baltimore Hotel, room 318. <laughs> so I titled my talk, Queer Feminism in the Context of Israel-Palestine, the Reality of Our Struggle for Justice, Equality, and Freedom. According to latest statistics, there are 12 million Palestinians in the world. 50%, amounting to 6 million of them, are living outside historic Palestine, mainly refugees ethnically cleansed during the Palestinian Nakba in 1948 and ever since. 38%, about 4. million Palestinians, live in the West Bank, besiege Gaza, and East Jerusalem, while 12%, or 1. million Palestinians, are citizens of the State of Israel. For many years, the conversation about Palestine was, confine, was confined to ending occupation, meaning addressing most of the rights of a mere 38% of the people in Palestine. I say most because even among the residents of Gaza and the West Bank, 44% are refugees. So aside from ending occupation, their most important right is the right to return to their homes of origin, 
of which they were systematically expelled. The Palestinian Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, known as BDS, is the first and only effort that addresses and unites the rights of all Palestinians, calling for Israel to meet its obligations under international law by first, ending occupation and dismantling the wall, second, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full e equality, and third, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties. BDS is a right-based movement that is democratic and inclusive. It is endorsed and led by the largest coalition of Palestinian civil society, representing Palestinians in 67, 48, and exile. BDS is not just about boycotting. It's first and foremost about self-determination of the Palestinian people in accordance with international law and universal principles of human rights. BDS is primar primarily about freedom, justice, and equality. Therefore, supporting Palestinian self-determination, at least, entails upholding the three basic rights listed in the BDS call. I am a Palestinian living inside Israel, a second generation of the indigenous people who after the Palestinian Nakba and the, establish the establishment of the State of Israel received Israeli citizenship, albeit a second class citizenship. Today, there are 1. million Palestinians living inside Israel, amounting to one fifth of the population. We have been called many names, Arab Israelis, Palestinians of 1948, Arab al meaning Arabs living inside Israel, and were ignored in all peace treaties, accords, and negotiations. BDS is the only effort that addresses the need to recognize our rights. Certainly, one of the most important successes of BDS is bringing human rights back to the agenda after they were omitted entirely from the Oslo peace process. And by focusing on rights rather than political solutions, BDS has unified Palestinians everywhere, despite the political division that exists today. Throughout my talk, I will address some of the geopolitical challenges facing Palestinians, citizens of the State of Israel, and, and shed the light on the reality of the Palestinian queer feminist struggle in the context of Israel-Palestine. So what's the everyday life like for Palestinians in Israel? What challenges do Palestinian queers face in the context of pinkwashing? And what's Aswat's contribution in creating a Palestinian queer feminist discourse that highlights the intersectionality of our struggle as Palestinians, as women, and as queer? Since we first organized in 2003, Aswat has united feminism, queerness, and resistance to all forms of oppression into one monumental struggle, working locally, nationally, regionally, and globally to promote the rights of all Palestinians with, with specificity to women, and more, more particularly, queer women. And as much as Israel wants us and the rest of the world to believe that we are less Palestinians, or at best, not part of the struggle for national liberation, the efforts of the feminist Palestinian queer movement led by inspiring activists from Aswat, Palestinian queer women, and El Qaus for sexual diversity, for sexual and gender diversity in Palestinian society, has mobilized a great deal of active solidarity around Palestine. These efforts continue to, to change perceptions among activists and academics here in North America, especially among queer groups who, are, who now more than ever realize they need to be in active solidarity with all Palestinians without confining their support to Palestinian queers. For over, a, for over a decade of work in activism, Aswat has worked tirelessly to address and tackle all forms of oppression facing Palestinian queer women as Palestinians and indigenous minority living inside Israel, suffering systematic discrimination in policies and practices, as women in the context of conflict and the geopolitical challenges in working within two completely different societies who are in conflict, and as queer in the context of homophobia and pinkwashing. Aswat additionally pays special attention to the dangers of normalization, as some women, queer, and youth groups and activists inadvertently undermine the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality by advocating normalization forums that bring Palestinians and or Arabs and Israelis together 
as if the two were symmetric and equal, as if occupation and apartheid were not existent. Advancing a feminist queer agenda should not and does not need to undermine the fundamental struggle for self-determination. Rather, it should be integrated at the heart of the struggle in an, in an organic way. Neither can women's rights nor LGBT rights be postponed till after liberation, as some may suggest. The comprehensive struggle for rights must be inclusive from the start. As what's unique insight roots our struggle as Palestinian feminist queers in relation of inter interdependency. It affirms that our struggle as Palestinian feminist queers is not merely related, rather our various axes of resistance are con contingent upon one another. To truly understand some of the challenges we face, we must not overlook the dangers of Israeli propaganda, which has been effective nationally and globally. For over a decade, and specifically since 2002, Israel invested massive resources on propaganda efforts. The latter, also known as Hasbara, target political elites, opinion makers, and the public simultaneously, and are carried out by government agencies, non-government organizations, lobbying groups, private citizens, students, journalists, and bloggers. The Israeli government practically encourages and rewards all citizens to take an active part in Hasbara. However, Reality on the ground debunks Israel's Hasbara efforts. For more than six decades, successive Israeli governments have systematically discriminated against Palestinian citizens of the state. They regularly enact legislations that exclude, ignore, discriminate against the Palestinian Arab minority. Since the establishment of its nation state, Israel has relied upon these laws to, go, to ground their discrimination their discriminatory treatment of Palestinian citizens in the legal system and perpetuate the unequal status and equal treatment of Jewish and Arab citizens. More than 50 Israeli laws ratified since 1948 directly or indirectly discriminate against Palestinian citizens of the state in all areas of life, including our rights to political participation, access to land, education, state budget resources, and criminal procedures. These laws and bills seek to dispossess and exclude us from land, turn our citizenship from right to conditional privilege, criminalize political expression, and privilege Jewish citizens in the allocations of state resources, including education. And let me start with that. I believe that everyone in this room believes that, that education should be equal for all. It is not the case in Israel especially that the education system donates pronounced racial inequalities. In fact, according to recent OECD reports acknowledged by the successive governments in Israel, Israel's total investment in a Palestinian student amounts to one-third of the total investment in an Israeli student. In the case of education, Israel does not need to enact a law to systematically discriminate against Palestinians. Taking a look on how Israel operates segregated school systems reveals a grim image of Israel's policies and practices towards us. Through the Ministry of Education, the Israeli government operates two separate systems of rules, procedures, and resource allocations, one for Israelis and one for Palestinian schools. Inequality in budget allocations is not the only form of discrimination. It is, however, most instrumental in creating huge socioeconomic gaps between Israelis and Palestinians. Rooted in the concepts of whitewashing, pinkwashing is an ever-growing propaganda aiming to brand and rebrand Israel as democratic, liberal, and gay-friendly. Israel further promotes its pinkwashing agenda in its advancements of, to of gay tolerance agenda in Israeli schools while hindering all efforts to promote education to sexual orientation and gender identity in Palestinian schools. In fact, in 2009, and following an attack on an LGBT center in Tel Aviv, the Ministry of Education started to invest ample resources to promote tolerance for gay rights in schools. These efforts included allocation of massive resources to Israeli gay organizations to create educational programs to produce gay tolerance literature to be integrated in school curricula and imp implemented by school staffers. 
issuing a directory to all schools obliging them to commemorate International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia on May 17th, obligating all professionals and service providers working within schools, including teachers, educators, school psychologists, counselors, and social workers, to attend training courses to better deal with gay people in their field of work. Open doors to gay organizations, Israeli gay organizations and activists to enter schools and talk directly to students and talk directly to students and youth about sexual orientation and gender identity, increasing their awareness and generating attitudes of tolerance and support. Needless to say, Palestinian schools, which operate under the same umbrella of the Ministry of Education, were totally excluded from these efforts. Palestinian first. Palestinian queer, it's important to note that Palestinian queer organizations are not part of the resource distribution. Many embassies in Tel Aviv, including the American Embassy, allocate funds to Israeli organizations to work, to work with our constituencies in Palestinian communities. The Israelis want to educate the Palestinians about gay rights. Second, the Ministry of Education did not offer any training to Palestinian professionals, professionals and service providers working within schools and did not monitor any implementation of its own directory. Third, and most importantly, since 2009, the Ministry of Education has been determined and consistent in sabotaging and hindering all efforts made by Aswad to offer professional training to people working within schools, through operating training courses and study days through the Ministry of Education. I've been personally engaged in these negotiations and all efforts were blocked. If anything, this highlights the unequal dynamics of power, enforcing identities, discriminate, enforcing identities in dis discriminated communities and how educating on one's identities is similar to the cond condescending perception of modernity and rights. Additionally, the concept of rights itself is prob problematized by the vicious cycle of deeming Palestinian not civilized enough to understand gay rights, while at the same time depriving us from access to equal resources and opportunities, which would automatically put us at a clear disadvantage. Pinkwashing is deeply rooted in the propaganda to portray a negative image of the Arab Palestinian as backwards, barbaric, and homophobic, while praising the enlightened, liberal, gay-friendly Israeli. It is invested in maintaining a vicious circles in order to depict Palestinians as such to justify oppression and unequal treatment. So when we talk about pinkwashing, we should go beyond the cynical effort by Israel to use gay rights to advance its liberal gay friendly image in international platform. It's part of the greater umbrella of branding Israel, of, of brand Israel cam campaigns. So in this reality, unlike, more, unlike most queer uh, groups and organizations oper operating in the region, Aswad is very much dependent on American donors. And in many cases, this means being subject to their criteria, which often expects policy change. But this is not relevant because in the context of, in, of Israel, where Israeli politicians are constantly calling for the murder and lit literal rape of Palestinians, our movements is not in a position to create Israeli policy. In the last few years, with the rise of an extremist right-wing government, and more specifically, since Israel's latest brutal aggression on Gazans, we're witnessing an unprecedented escalation of violence, incitement, and nationalistic attacks targeting all Palestinians. While Gaza suffered one of the deadliest attacks, Israeli academics, politicians, religious leaders orchestrated incitement campaigns promoted by the Israeli media targeted against Palestinians. For example, Middle East scholar Dr. Mordechai Kedar of Barilan University in Tel Aviv made a provocative statement encouraging gender violence and encouraging the use of rape as terror deterrent. He was quoted on August uh, 2014 during the brutal aggression on Gazans. Rape Palestinian mothers and sisters. If Palestinians knew their mothers will be raped, they will not commit acts of resistance to state oppression. 
Israeli politicians were eager to brand Palestinians as terrorists, as a um, me member of Knesset, Ayelet Sheked, who calls herself a feminist Zionist, was calling for a genocide for all Palestinians. All Palestinians are Israel's enemies and must be killed, branding us all as terrorists. We should kill all Palestinian mothers as well. They are the snakes who breed more Palestinians. Prominent Jewish re religious leaders in Israel casually call for genocide. Rabbi Israel, a very prominent religious leader, he called on Palestinian political leader to be hanged just one week before a Palestinian bus driver was found lynched in Jerusalem. State police violence during and after the attack on Gaza was unprecedented. Israeli police, who train American police, committed police brutality at unprecedented levels. In peaceful marches and demonstrations inside Israel during the aggression, police used lethal weapons against unarmed protesters. Our peaceful marches were faced with tear gas bombs, stun grenades, rubber coated bullets, skunk sewage water mixed with God knows chemicals, random arrests, lengthy detentions with severe release restrictions. In the heart of these waves of incitement, re-elected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calls for striping, st sorry, stripping Palestinians, citizens of Israel, of their Israeli citizenship. Even the brutal murder of the Palestinian teenager, Muhammad Abu Khdir, was portrayed through pinkwashing strategy. Mohammed Abu Khdir, the Israeli media claimed, was killed because he was gay. While gay rights might mean to some the right to have gay tourism and party, marry and kiss in public, in the context of Israel-Palestine, it cannot be disassociated from deep socioeconomic, cultural, political, and racial discrimination. So what's the ethical role of academics, you ask? In my opinion, first and foremost, the ethical roles of Western academia is not to be patronizing and listen to the oppressed community. Hear our wishes, aspirations, instead of, that, instead of telling us what to do. More specifically, academics should make room for ethical, equal epistemology and constantly question their positionalities and privileges and should always go back to the community before writing about them. Recent history of queer groups in the region has taught us very often intervention by outsiders who do not possess a real sense of reality on the ground and fail to take into consideration at best possible options for the locals can have disastrous outcomes. Perhaps the most important consideration should be to cause no harm. This is an ethical principle. Before you stand in solidarity with Palestine, and your university's complicity in the violation of human rights. A lot of academics want to be in solidarity with Palestinian queers, but are not stopping their university's complicity and investment in funds in oppressive, oppressive systems that continues to violate the rights of all Palestinians. You have to take a stand against oppressive systems. You have to end your role in complicity with Israel. Your money is causing harm. Your university's investment fund is causing harm. Martin Luther King noted once, at the very basic level, you have an obligation to withdraw your support from an evil system or policy. This should always come first. In terms of academics and activists, some academics see their roles only as academics. Challenging society intellectually is necessary, but not sufficient. I see academia and activism as organically connected. Intellectual contribution is essential, but not sufficient. It should not stand on its own merits. So what's next? Palestinian queers come to America and talk about our challenges. Edward Said noted once, criticizing Israel is the last taboo. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the last taboo has been shattered. With Palestinian queer activism and discourse, and now with BDS, the last taboo has been shattered. It's controversial to criticize Israel, but it's not a taboo anymore. And now is the time to take action. Our struggle is dominated by the intersectionality of, by the intersectionality of oppression, and the, same, and the same dynamics of intersectional struggles can be found in a group like Aswat. In light of the international solidarity, 
Aswat is looking for academic and organizational partnership and solidarity networks that would respect our right of locating and redefining our own struggle with our, our own context. Only with the existence of grassroots groups like Aswat and with the sensitive support of donors, academics, and activists in the international community can, over, can the overreaching can, can the overacting structure of op oppression be dismantled? Thank you very much.